I'm Kento Bento. This video is made possible by CuriosityStream. By signing up at the link in the description, you'll also get access to my upcoming Nebula original about one of the most shocking murder cases in Chinese history. But more on that at the end. Now, our last video was about the start of 2020, all the likely Asian events to happen in the first six months. But this video is about how it all ends. We'll be breaking down the final six months of 2020, all 29 future events, and as you will see, things get even crazier. But just quickly, for those wondering what happened to our usual story illustration videos, don't worry, they'll be back next time. So make sure to click that bell button to get notified. So with that said, we will start from July. Japan will see a spectacular sight up in the summer sky as a magnificent meteor shower enters Earth's atmosphere. But this phenomenon isn't what it seems, because it won't be from outer space, but from a Tokyo-based startup called ALE. You see, if all goes according to plan, this will be the world's first artificial media shower or man-made shooting stars, made up of thousands of tiny balls that are ejected from satellites in space, something perhaps out of a James Bond film. These balls, all filled with a secret chemical formula, then plunge through the atmosphere in a grand spectacle of lights, visible to millions of people across the region. And this can be reproduced anywhere in the world. But why is this even planned for the July skies of Japan? Well because of this. Starting July 24th, the 32nd edition of the Olympics will be held in Tokyo. Now, this would make Tokyo the first Asian city to host the Summer Games twice, as well as making Japan a four-time Olympic host. Tokyo 2020 will also be the second of three consecutive Olympics held in East Asia, between Pyeongchang 2018 in South Korea and Beijing 2022 in China. Now, you could say that Tokyo 2020 had been foretold for quite some time, as just as The Simpsons was able to predict a Donald Trump presidency 16 years earlier, the cult classic manga and anime Akira was able to predict Tokyo being the home of the 2020 Olympics almost 40 years earlier, this back in 1982. But while this particular prophecy worked out, we should hope this doesn't mean Akira will be getting other things right too, like, well, World War III, but more on that later. The future may or may not involve war, but it certainly will robots. And being in Japan, the Olympics, for the very first time, will be chock full of them. There will be robots that guide spectators to seats, robots that deliver food and drink right to you during action, athlete assistance robots that retrieve items like javelins and shot puts, mobility assistance robots, mascot robots, and much more. All this quite the marvel. But it's not just Japan with the technological advancements. Over in West Asia, the UAE will be making their own mark as they attempt to launch the country's first mission to Mars, also scheduled for July. In fact, this will be the first mission to Mars by any West Asian, Arab, or Muslim-majority country. The aim of this probe mission is to study the red planet's climate while attempting to answer long-standing questions of the scientific community, like why Mars' atmosphere is losing hydrogen and oxygen into space, and much like Earth, why it's undergoing its own bout of climate change. Though not to be outdone, China will also launch their first mission to Mars with the HX-1 project, aiming to deploy an orbiter and rover for comprehensive planetary exploration. But hold on, the Mars bar will be raised even further, because in 2020, the UAE and China will be joined on Mars by the US with NASA's Mars rover mission and Russia and Europe with their joint venture ExoMars, meaning it'll be quite the Martian party, which is fine and all provided they plan it well. Now, back on Earth, the world's oldest serving state leader, Malaysia's Prime Minister Mahathir Mohamad, will turn 95 in July. Note, Mohamad narrowly holds the record ahead of second place Queen Elizabeth II, appropriately named. He was sworn in rather recently in 2018, but being a nonagenarian and all, he was expected to step down as Prime Minister by 2020. Thus far, however, he is not. And in fact, he has since suggested he will stay in power beyond 2020, proclaiming he needs more time to fix the problems created by the previous government. How much more time? Well, with a new economic plan slated to be rolled out by 2030, he may be well over 100 by the time he steps down. Now in August, Japan will commemorate the 75th anniversary of the Hiroshima and Nagasaki atomic bombings. Of course, as we know, this is the only time that nuclear weapons have been used in warfare. Nuclear power, though, is wide-ranging, especially across the sea in China. China is one of the world's largest producers and is set to make history around this time with the opening of the world's first self-sustaining nuclear fusion reactor in Sichuan. This device is also known as an artificial sun, as like the real sun, its goal is to harness fusion. Except there is a difference. The artificial sun will be able to reach temperatures 13 times hotter 
than the real thing, able to reach 200 million degrees Celsius or 360 million degrees Fahrenheit. Despite this, the energy arising from this process is actually cleaner, cheaper, and safer than current nuclear options around the world. And speaking of clean energy, August will see China also start operations on the world's largest waste-to-energy power plant, but in Shenzhen. This, perhaps, is more than necessary, as China produces more waste than any other country. Shenzhen, in particular, with a population of 20 million people, produces a whopping 15,000 tons daily, though this just means there will be a lot of fuel for the plant. Concerns, however, have been raised regarding just how clean the process really is, as there are fears that waste ash and airborne pollutants could end up in drinking water. With similar projects in many other Chinese cities, this has become a nationwide concern met with protests. And we can't bring up China and protests without also mentioning Hong Kong, which will be holding its legislative elections in September. China, perhaps unsurprisingly, may be tempted to outright block the elections given last year's massive electoral swing to pro-democracy candidates. But of course, this could lead to even bigger protests and more international condemnation. The easier route for them really would be to control the election outcome, given only half of the seats are chosen by popular vote, with the rest being easily influenced by the Chinese government. And speaking of influence, Twitter has already suspended over 200,000 state-run Chinese accounts that have targeted the Hong Kong protest movement. Now, this seems just a precursor to the 2020 online antics though, as according to US intelligence sources, China may very well attempt to hack the upcoming US elections. Of course, whoever becomes US president is of particular interest to China, especially with policy ramifications relating to the ongoing US-China trade war. But whether Xi Jinping desires for a Trump re-election or the alternative remains uncertain. Sure, ousting Trump could mean trade relief for China, but on the other hand, experts say Trump's isolating policies in general have been affording Beijing the space to expand its influence across Asia and the world, and in the process, greatly weakening Washington's global leadership. Meaning keeping Trump in office could perhaps be a great long-term strategy for them. Now, in response to the trade war, which has been internationally criticized, Southeast Asian nations under ASEAN, along with five of their major trading partners, Japan, South Korea, China, Australia, and New Zealand, have been crafting what is to be the world's largest trade deal, set to be signed in 2020. We're talking so large, it would form a major trading block covering a third of the world's GDP, larger than any other regional trading blocks like the European Union and the United States-Mexico-Canada Agreement, which recently replaced NAFTA. And this is especially notable as the US will not even be part of it, which is why experts consider this new trade deal a highly effective way for Beijing to further cut off US influence in Asia. But at least one major US company will find their fortunes turned in an Asian country come September, because Apple is set to open its very first Apple store in India. Now, this might seem like deja vu, as I said this very point in last year's 2019 video. But just like Eurovision Asia, there has been constant delays. This time though, Apple has actually made official a location, a store in India's largest city, Mumbai, and has signed a lease. With Apple currently making only about 1% of the whole Indian smartphone market, these new stores may just breathe new life into their Indian expansion. But from Apple Store to IKEA Store now, the world's largest furniture retailer, along with their world-famous Swedish meatballs, will be opening not just their first store in the Philippines, but it will be their biggest store in the world. This will be a whopping 65,000 square meters, roughly the size of 150 basketball courts. And speaking of store firsts, I just want to quickly announce that the Kento Bento merch store is launching today. Okay, I know in the last video I said it wouldn't be for another month, but screw it, I can't wait, it's today. So if you're interested in our brand new Kento Bento merch and want to support this channel, please stay tuned to the very end after the sponsor. Now, about this time, the UAE will likely finish up construction on the world's tallest Ferris wheel. This record 250 meter tall circular structure in Dubai will be 80 meters taller than the current record holder High Roller in Las Vegas, as well as almost double the height of the London Eye. And just in time for what's been called the world's greatest show. As October, we'll see Dubai host the 2020 World Expo. This will be the first World Expo held in the Middle East and will span six months. The event being a global showcase for the achievements of nations, having started from the 1851 Great Exhibition in London. This event, considered by many as the Olympics of Innovation, now happens once every five years and attracts millions of visitors around the world. And that's not surprising, considering past expos have introduced many of modern history's greatest inventions and achievements, like the telephone and ketchup in 1876, the Eiffel Tower in 1880, 
1889, the dishwasher, zipper, and Ferris wheel in 1893, x-rays and ice cream cones in 1904, the television in 1939, cherry cola in 1985, and much more. And who knows what could be unveiled this time around in Expo 2020. So far, 192 countries have been confirmed to be taking part in the event, and will be showcasing their nation's latest and greatest architecture and technology. Interestingly though, Israel will be one of these participating nations, despite the UAE not recognizing them as a state, having no diplomatic relations. Even Israeli tourists will be expected to attend, with sources claiming this may even lead to permanent entry. Out of the 20 million visitors that Expo 2020 is expected to get, 70% will be coming from outside the UAE, which would be the largest proportion of international visitors in the 169 year history of World Expos. And well, that will include me, because I'll be attending. Now, like Tokyo 2020, the aftermath of such a momentous event covering such a vast area can be short-sighted and wasteful. But Dubai has a plan, because the Expo 2020 site will be transformed into what will be known as District 2020. This will be a smart and sustainable micro city within a city, a mixed-use global innovation hub designed to support a new diverse urban community of 90,000 people. But from High Tech Expo to, well, High Tech Expo, Japan will be following on from this event as well as the aforementioned Robot Studded Olympics with the first ever World Robot Summit in October. This will be an international robotics event where the latest robotic technologies will be exhibited along with world-class competitions where robots are pitted against each other. Now, switching gears, you might remember YouTuber Mr. Beast launching the Team Trees initiative back in October 2019, which aimed to plant 20 million trees by the end of the year. This was ultimately successful, but he certainly wasn't able to do it alone, as he had the help of many of YouTube's top creators, as well as the Arbor Day Foundation. And really, given how insanely huge the project was, this seemed the only way. Well, unless you had the resources of an entire nation. What am I getting at? Well, Armenia launched a very similar initiative to plant 10 million trees by October 2020. Actually, the exact date is 10th of October, so 1010 with 10 million trees planted. You see, this is to symbolize the unity of 10 million Armenians across the world, as well as, of course, helping in the global fight against climate change. With this coincidentally launched in the exact same month as Mr. Beast's Team Trees project, Armenia's movement seemed to have been completely overshadowed. Now, also in October, the long-standing United Nations arms embargo on Iran, yes, Iran, is supposed to be lifted after four decades of sanctions. But with the recent unraveling of events, including the one I'm sure you're all aware of, and also a big part of why this video is way over a week late, sorry, it's become highly questionable whether it will even transpire. You see, and I'm going to read this part super fast because I don't really know how many of you are that interested, five years ago, Iran agreed to a long-term deal on its controversial nuclear program with the five permanent member states of the UN Security Council and European Union. After years of tension over Iran's alleged efforts to develop a nuclear weapon. This, of course, was the Iran nuclear deal. In this deal, Iran agreed to cut down on its sensitive nuclear activities, as well as allowing in international inspectors. In return, crippling economic sanctions would be lifted, as well as that long-standing United Nations arms embargo, a non-negotiable term Iran insisted on, which was agreed to only take effect five years from that point, so October 2020 onwards. All was going as planned, then Trump. Trump pulled the US out of the deal in 2018, and sanctions were slapped back on. In retaliation, Iran broke some of the conditions of the deal, reaching limits on its nuclear capacity. The crisis continued to escalate throughout 2019, with all these events culminating in the US Embassy attack in Baghdad in New Year's Eve, that was 2019. Now, that was the state of play until January 3rd, 2020, after I had already finished the script for this video and didn't think it necessary to explain all that. But then in a move no one saw coming, Trump killed the top-ranked Iranian general Qassam Soleimani in a drone strike near Baghdad International Airport, who was widely considered the second most powerful person in Iran after the supreme leader Ayatollah Khamenei. Khamenei threatened severe revenge on the US as both sides continued their escalating war of words. Iran then responded by shooting missiles at US bases in Iraq, and now people are talking about World War III. Damn it, stop predicting stuff. So to sum it up, the Iran nuclear deal is now a mess, with Iran declaring it will no longer abide by the restrictions of the deal. Though they did say they were still open to having things go back the way it was as long as US sanctions are once again lifted, which isn't surprising, mind you, as Iran is hurting real bad economically. And to bring it back full circle, remember they still want that UN arms embargo finally lifted in October, which will only happen if Iran goes back to abiding by the terms of that nuclear deal. So it's in their best interest, though it's something quite unlikely with Trump remaining as president. As such, Iran will sure to be yet another country with, shall we say, a keen interest in the outcome of the upcoming November elections. And after all, that and regretfully ending up with a 25 minute upload, I'm now wondering why I didn't just make a separate video on this topic. But one person in particular keeping a close eye on the Iran situation is Kim Jong-un. 
With Trump eliminating Soleimani the way he did, King was probably thinking, boy, it's a good thing I have nuclear weapons, or well, they would have drone striked me too. I made the right choice. After all, having an official agreement as opposed to a nuclear deterrent certainly didn't save the Iranians. Sure, sanctions continue to hurt, but nukes have gone Pyongyang, a seat at the table with the United States, appearing to have ensured the immunity of the regime from any outside attack. Now, in our last video covering the first six months of 2020, we predicted Kim Jong-un would go back to threatening with nukes in his New Year's address, and that's pretty much what happened. Though some have speculated it could just be a calculated attempt at extracting last-minute diplomatic concessions from Trump. With this being a US election year, Kim may be betting on Trump's desperation for a political win, as in finally securing that elusive North Korea deal that may just, well, end up more favorable to the regime. Now, if that doesn't work and he feels Trump ain't working for him, analysts say North Korea may just interfere in the elections themselves, because ain't that what the cool kids are doing these days? And if you watch our previous North Korea videos, you'll know just how capable they are on the cyber front. So, it's all been building up to the US elections in November, which would normally not be mentioned here given it's obviously not taking place in Asia, but as we've seen, several Asian countries have outright made it an Asian affair. And it's not just North Korea, Iran, and China with likely attempts at meddling with the elections, but the poster child themselves, Russia. Now, as often the case, there will be some who question why we're including Russia in a video about Asian-related matters. But given Russia is the largest of transcontinental nations with the majority of their land in Asia, I think it's fine. So it's been widely reported that the Russian government interfered in the 2016 US elections. And now experts claim it'll happen again in 2020. This time though, the US will be anticipating the attacks. So the question is, how will the Russians adjust their game plan? Indeed, there's a lot of mystery surrounding what they will do and how they will do it. But note, while it can be reasonably speculated which side countries like North Korea, Iran, and China would prefer in power, as in which candidate they intend to elevate through hacking and disinformation campaigns, it's not so clear with Russia. In fact, rather than a strong preference in any one candidate, Moscow's underlying MO has always been to create chaos above all else, using their classic approach of agitation and propaganda, pitting different sides within the community against each other, and undermining America's faith in democracy. What the Russians really want is for the American people to give up on their system. But let me just make one thing clear. I'm by no means extolling the virtues of America, as it's clear from history that the US government has done their fair share of foreign interference, as have most governments. So this time around, Russia will be looking at alternative ways to influence the election, which analysts say could involve the direct manipulation of voting voter rolls, and the weaponization of deep fakes, or deep fake technology, software that makes it easy to simulate a person's face on another person's body. As you can imagine, this has the potential to be election altering. Now Trump will be up against whoever wins the Democratic nomination from earlier on in the year, whether Biden, Sanders, Warren, Buttigieg, Bloomberg, or Yang. And speaking of, some criticized us in our last video for mentioning Andrew Yang and not the other Democratic candidates. But of course, we would as this series is specifically about Asian places and Asian people in 2020. That's kind of the point. And in any case, I don't even live in the US, so I don't have skin in the game. Anyway, Yang's a dark horse, but if he somehow got the nomination and was elected, he'd make history as the first Asian American US president. Either way, considering his lack of political experience and comparatively low net worth, Yang has already exceeded far beyond expectations. If Trump loses the election now, the G20 summit 18 days later in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia will become one of his last major political events as president before the winner gets inaugurated in January. The G20, being the meeting of world leaders from 19 countries and the EU, is arguably the most important international summit in the world, with many of the contentious issues already mentioned in this video likely to be discussed. Now, by the end of 2020, the Philippines is set to release a groundbreaking drug to treat the perilous dengue virus. This is a world first and will very much be in demand as dengue cases in tropical countries like the Philippines have been increasing dramatically over the last two decades, becoming one of the worst mosquito-borne human pathogens out there. But something the Philippines isn't doing so well at is plastic pollution, as they, along with Vietnam, Indonesia, Thailand, and China, are among the worst culprits. With their fast-growing economies and populations, coupled with huge coastlines and densely populated cities, the local seas in much of Southeast Asia are now being filled with trash and plastic waste. Note, more than 8 million tons of plastic are being dumped in the world's oceans each year, which is about a truckload per minute. Fortunately, at least one country in Southeast Asia, albeit a tiny one, is doing their part. And I mean, something pretty drastic, which is becoming the world's first plastic neutral country by December. I'm talking about East Timor, or Timor-Leste, the only Asian country located completely in the Southern Hemisphere. With a new $40 million plastic recycling plant, no plastic used in the country will become waste. 
an inspiration for the world perhaps. But now leaving this world, we head to asteroid 162173 Ryugu, a primitive carbonaceous near-Earth object and a potentially hazardous asteroid of the Apollo group. Carbonaceous asteroids are expected to preserve the most pristine materials in the solar system and is likely to hold vital information on the building blocks of our universe, and in particular, the origin of water and organic compounds on Earth. This, of course, is relevant to the origin of life on Earth. With asteroid Ryugu being particularly rich with carbon, there's great expectation that a sample from this asteroid will contain organic matter. And well, that's exactly what Japan's Hayabusa 2 asteroid mission is attempting to accomplish. The Hayabusa 2 spacecraft spent much of the last one and a half years obtaining samples from Ryugu and is set to return to Earth around December 2020. Now, the asteroid named Ryugu refers to the Dragon Palace, a magical underwater palace in Japanese folklore. In the most famous story, the fisherman Urashima Taro travels to the palace on the back of a turtle and upon returning carries with them a mysterious box, much like Hayabusa 2 returning with mysterious samples. But this is not the only sample return mission making its mark in December, because just as Hayabusa 2 will return to Earth, China's Chang'e 5 is set to launch. Their mission though is to obtain at least 2 kilograms of lunar soil and rock samples, which if successful would make this the first sample return mission to the moon in 44 years, the last being the USSR in 1976. This will make China the third ever country to accomplish this feat. Now, I guess in keeping with the theme, China's spacecraft Chang'e is actually named after the Chinese goddess of the moon, the subject of several legends in Chinese folklore. And speaking of notable Chinese stories, my upcoming Nebula original show will be released on Nebula in a couple weeks. I spent ages on this thing. And, well, I won't say too much about it, except that it's a real-life Chinese murder story so shocking, so unnerving, that sponsors didn't want to sponsor it, and YouTube kept demonetizing earlier versions of the upload. Which is actually how and why it ended up on Nebula, a streaming platform you can get for free as part of a special deal if you sign up to CuriosityStream in the link below. Now at the end of this video I'll be revealing all the new Kento Bento merch items for today's launch, so don't go anywhere. But first, Nebula. Nebula is created by a group of independent creators, including myself, Polymatter, Wendover Productions, Real Engineering, CGP Grey, and Kutzkasa. It's self-funded, not backed by investors, and we've managed to make it largely ad-free and with no dreaded algorithm. We started Nebula so we could try out new content ideas that might not work on YouTube, stuff that would likely get demonetized like my Nebula original show, as well as fun collaborative projects like Working Titles, a series where each episode different creators examine the opening sequence to their favorite TV shows. Polyphonic did Game of Thrones, Nando V Movies did One Punch Man, Cinema Wins did Stranger Things, Patrick H. Willems did X-Men, Volksgeist did Neon Genesis Evangelion, and there's more to come. The purpose of Nebula is not to pull people away from YouTube, but rather the goal is to create a sandbox where we can learn and experiment on our own terms. We've only just started, but if you want to experience and be part of helping us build this unique platform, Nebula, well it's now made easier thanks to CuriosityStream. CuriosityStream wants to help us grow our platform, so they're offering all Kento Bento viewers free access to Nebula when you sign up at curiositystream.com slash Kento Bento. Of course, by signing up for CuriosityStream alone, you'll get access to thousands of the world's top documentaries like The Great Train Robbery, The Mona Lisa Mystery, The Great War of Thrones, Hayabusa 2 Asteroid Explosion, which we just talked about, and much more. So unlimited access to both CuriosityStream and Nebula is for a very reasonable $2.99 a month. And even better, by entering the promo code Kento Bento during the sign-up process, your membership will be completely free for the first 31 days. And finally, I'm super excited to announce the launch of the official Kento Bento merch store. It's been a long time coming. At the moment, we have six items, which I'll quickly run through. So we have two Asian-y shirts, one dark, one light, pretty much for anyone who's a fan of our Asian-y content, Asian-y videos, or just interested in Asian-related stuff in general. There's also a third design if you prefer something with Japanese characters. Here we have my bearded mug on the front and Kento Bento written in Japanese on the back. And speaking of mugs, we have this beauty, which I'm drinking out of right now as I'm recording this. Again, our logo and asian -y on the other side. There's also a Kento Bento enamel pin, which you can stick on your bag or your jacket, and a Kento Bento sticker set, which you can use to decorate anything from your laptop to hey, people. So you can get all this by going to our merch store at standard.tv slash Kento Bento, the link's in the description. And for anyone asking, we ship to just about anywhere in the world, though maybe not North Korea. One more thing, a few days ago was the five year anniversary of when this channel started, and it's been incredible to see how far it's come. So I just want to say thank you to all our subscribers, and we'll certainly be doing our very best to keep up the quality. Anyway, this has gone on long enough, so uh, check out our merch, check out Nebula, and I'll see you again in the next 
Asian Eat video.